spend too much time. Um, I will point out all of the presentations that I'm giving are available on the USB sticks that I'm going to give you this afternoon, um, including the notes pages, which you can tell I'm actually reading from here. So that's so that you can do this on a self-study basis. When you do these on self-study, we have learning objectives at the front and a test at the end. But in a classroom setting, setting we don't do that. So I'm just going to give you the outline of the major topics. And the first topic here is characterizing an alerting authority. So I already talked about the need for having a register of alerting authorities. And so I won't uh, make too much of that except to point out it's possible that different register entries would make conflicting assertions. And that's actually fairly common. For instance, an earthquake in Japan was reported initially by the USGS as magnitude 8.9, but the Japan Meteorological Agency called it an 8.8. .8. Now, who do you consider official in when there's two things? You're aware of journalists and what they do. They typically cite both. They're both authoritative. The fact they don't agree is fine. <laughs> you give both information to the public. That's how it's typically done. In the case of the alerting authority, whether or not they decide to um, converge their opinions later is entirely up to them. In that case, they did. And they both decided um, 9.0, actually. So neither one was right. <laughs> so in the International Register of Alerting Authorities, We have 191 members. That's 185 nations and six territories. And we talked about the PRs are being responsible to uh, put these in. They are entering um, for the uh, only for those that are recognized by the World Meteorological Organization. Now, that's slightly different than the number of nations that are participating, for example, in the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. It's 192 nations versus 185 in the case of the uh, WMO. I think the, the differences are places like San Marino or the Holy See, which, I mean, the Vatican doesn't get its really its own weather. <laughs> they kind of get Rome's weather. But at any rate, um, as we've already pointed out, you can have the cap feed URL. And then aggregators go to the register to pick up those URLs, which tells them the things they need to monitor if they want to do it on a local basis. Or of course, they could get the aggregated feed with an alert hub. This is the um, web interface of the register. And Um, it is also connected to what's called the object identifiers. Uh, this is a system um, invented by the ITU many, many years ago, way before the internet. Um, and it's all standards actually have OIDs. The standard itself has an OID. Um, if you've ever used Active Directory, every organization has an OID. They're used throughout the IT infrastructure, we adopted that for use in identifying officially um, authorities that are registered in the National Register of Alerting Authorities, which is why we have this little thing up here, the 249, 2.49.0.0.840, which happens to be the code for the United States. And in the United States, the first one that we registered was the National Weather Service. So it's 840.0. We also have in the register the ability for the authority to say, what's the basis on which you issue alerts? Now, you may think, oh, everybody could do that. Just go cite the law that gives you authority to issue alerts. No, actually, 
Uh, most agencies who are issuing alerts officially are doing so by executive order, uh, by tradition, by something much less rigorous than law. But if you do have a legal basis, or even if you have a policy, just say what it is. Uh, that's of interest, uh, particularly as we try to harmonize things going down the road. Um, so here I want to skip over now and talk about identifying alerting authorities and their alerting messages. So this is the document from WMO that describes the procedure for registering alerting authorities, or alerting identifiers of authorities. Um, the reason I show this uh, slide is primarily because I love the cover. <laughs> it's such a cool picture. That's alerting, all right. <laughs> That's hands-on alerting. The OID. I said that the OID that you get uniquely for your country and then for each of the authorities that your country um, registers has its own tree. And in that tree, all the identifiers that start with a two are done jointly by ISO and ITU. That's why it's a two. Then the 49 means this is about alerting. So the node 2.49 was reserved for alerting. Dot zero is the WMO register of alerting authorities. So all of your identifiers will start with 249.0. And if you go to the OID repository, which probably none of you have done in the past, but you could go there if you like. Oh, that's the table. See, I thought it was my computer that was blocking that. You know, maybe I can just make this thing a little bit higher. At any rate, if you go to this tree, you can see this stuff better. There we go. You can see um, the entries um, that are listed there, and then you go down one level, and you see all of the countries. So each country has a two-character um, identifier, which you know from URLs, right? So you have Argentina is uh, AR, I believe. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is TT. The US is US. And as I said, there's a number. So there's two kinds of codes in ISO 3166. We're using the number. And here, if you went down to the one that points specifically to the US, you see the entry there in the OID tree corresponds to the register in, or to the entry in the register of alerting authorities. Maintaining this, a letter was sent to all PRs, permanent representatives with WMO, in November 2009, almost nine years ago describing the Register of Alerting Authorities and asking them, directing, if you will, from the SG, Secretary General, to designate an editor. Thus far, only two-thirds of the WMO members have actually done so. We have at this moment 273 alerting authorities across the 195 ter countries and territories, and two organizations. So you met NET, for example, is a alerting authority, but it's transnational, or international, if you will. We have at least one editor for 127 of the WMO members, so we're still missing about a third. But the number of editors is 142. Hmm, why is that different? You can have more than one editor per country. And there are 15 WMO members who have more than one editor listed. But the editors are the ones who actually go ahead and enter things. So they get a password assigned to them, and they're the ones who make that. In some cases, the PR designated himself or herself, and that's fine. How do we track changes to the register? Well, the register itself has a news feed. It happens to be in the RSS format. That news feed gives you whatever has changed. So the top thing is the most recent change. 
So obviously this is a screenshot right after the National Weather Service had changed its record because that's the top level thing. So if you're an aggregator like Google or AccuWeather or the weather company or Reuters or whoever, you can be up to date with the register because there's an automated process that sends that out in news feed format, which is the most common way uh, on the internet to do frequently updated works. When you go to get a news feed, your browser automatically will format it for you in a way that gives you the option to subscribe to the feed. Okay? So the browser does that automatically. Another reason like why we like news feeds, it's built into the internet, built into browsers. But when you're looking at that, again, this is what the source looks like underneath it. Um, and that's what we generate so that people can subscribe to them. That's because this is XML. And what's the cool thing about XML? Machines like it as well as humans, right? So the machine can process this stuff. The human goes, eh. But you get a nice HTML page, which you can read. The machine gets the stuff it can process, OK? So same idea as CAP itself. The news feed is in XML. And this is how we keep up to date with the register. And so this is the key points. We're characterizing an alerting authority with a few things. Where is the area where you normally do alerting? A little map. What are the kinds of alerts you do, like geo, meteorological, et cetera? Optional field to describe what's the authoritative basis. You know, do you have a law? Do you have policy? What is, what is it that lets you do what you do? Um, we talked a little bit about identifying the alerting authorities and alert messages which are done preferably with OIDs. Now, you might not want to use an OID, and you don't have to, but it's an easy way to make your CAP alerts globally unique, which is a requirement. And its uniqueness comes because we know that that's within that alerting authority, which is already unique throughout the world. OK, talked a little bit about uh, maintaining the register. Um, which we do through editors, and the editors are designated by PRs, or should be, <laughs> in any case, one-third still haven't done it, but most of you have. And tracking changes is because it has a feed showing whenever there's an update. Okay? Again, this is the self-test, in case you were taking this on your own. Then the classroom environment, that concludes this presentation. So these are the reference links, pretty similar to the ones I just showed you on the last one. Any quick questions on this topic? Okay.